everybody. This is another edition of Watch and Resist as part of our Read and Resist um, collective and collaborative forum that centres on transformative justice. Um, and as always, uh, your hosts, Flick and Fabien, um, we're hosting today and we are really, really um, excited and happy to be with our new Read and Resist friend, um, Ruth Wakefield. And we're going to be talking about today um, the, about the interconnection between healing, trauma, and Ruth's work as a hypnotherapist and beyond, and thinking about some of these healing practices in real time um, during COVID. And we're going to be having a kitchen table kind of discussion, so super informal around these themes. Um, so Ruth, if I can in, uh, invite you to introduce yourself a little bit um, to the audience, and then we can go from there, really. Hi, so I'm Ruth Wakefield, and I've got to say hello to this lovely boy that's just appeared. There you go. Football kit. Hiya. And that was a great picture. So I'm thought. really, really glad you showed me that. That's very I cool. Thought, and they taught the military cannon Thank <laughs> you. You okay. are so talented. That's amazing. All right, so, so are you going to go back to... I want to stay by mommy. No, okay, but we're going to turn off, okay? So let, let Ruth <laughs> talk, yeah? Cool. Okay. Hi. So I'm Ruth Wakeford. I'm a hypnotherapist. I've not been doing it that long, about four years, and I'm based in Hampshire in England. I first got interested in hypnosis or hypnotherapy, hypnosis really, when I was five years old. When I was watching Michael Parkinson with sat on my dad's lap, lap and I really remember clearly there was a comedy hypnotist on. I don't remember an awful lot about what happened other than just being transfixed and thinking this is magical mm. and then when I learned to drive my driving instructor was training as a hypnotherapist so I kind of learned a lot more about that side of it and he practiced on me as well and I also had hypnotherapy for confidence so I did pass my test on my third attempt with his help that's so cool and, uh, and so then um yeah, then we bumped into somebody else who had just qualified, a, a friend of my husband's wife just qualified. We met them on holiday in Malta by accident and became good friends. And we just constantly were talking about hypnosis every time we got together. She said, you really just need to go and train. And so that's what I did. That's and fantastic. four years later, I absolutely love it. And great. And um, what? Stop about it. <laughs> yeah, this is great. I remember you saying in an earlier conversation with us that, um, it doesn't feel like work to you it feels like not at all yeah part of you what 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 is it that gives you yeah that makes you feel like that what how does it feel to you I think I love people people are mm. fascinating everybody is so different with a completely different character and story even two identical twins can be completely different in their experiences mm. of life and so I love hearing people's stories and just really listening to them and if somebody comes in feeling for want of a better word feeling crap mm, yeah they leave feeling great feeling optimistic hopeful mm. looking forward to the next session and this might be the first time they felt this good in a long time you know how can you not love doing that giving you know just facilitating somebody feeling better you know that's the best feeling in the world and it's not an ego thing at all it's just it's just nice to see people happy yeah, I think as well, in terms of giving people hope, and it seems like it's restorative, right? As in, you're kind of equipping people with the tools to, to, to be, engage with themselves, right? But to, to be. Um, yeah, just to yeah. find, yourself, I suppose, without feeling judged. Mm. confidence to go out in the world and carry on being their authentic self which is I think the only way you can really feel comfortable about yourself is if you are your true self and if you've got to feel like you've got to put an act on all day it gets really weary and tiresome yeah. and you're, you're not happy mm. you're just playing a part and you're gonna, if you're putting on that act all the time not being your real self I think how is anybody supposed to get to know you if you don't let them see you and so it's about giving people a confidence about who they actually are and actually I think sometimes it's the first time people feel they've really been able to open up mm. you know, as wonderful as doctors are 
they've only got 10 minutes yeah and for some of the things people come to me for as well they're scared of going to the doctor because for instance you know I've had people that have been on cocaine or marijuana and they've got children they haven't harmed their children yeah they're good parents but they don't feel they can go to the doctor for fear of having their children taken away and so it's another option which works really really well for them it seems to be yeah I understand that and they're, they're, they're you know they're brave to take that step so they shouldn't mm -hmm. be judged okay. yeah I agree I think you know there's a vulnerability isn't there in wanting to kind of it's not always about shedding but sometimes with this kind of being opening yourself up and shedding kind of layers of kind of like skin like you're, you're shedding so much in this kind it's of process definitely layers yeah it's a term I often describe it to people that it's almost like an onion yeah you know, they'll come in with that top layer of onion showing the skin and by the time they've finished all their sessions mm. you know I've met every layer of them you know you just peel them all back one by one in a very gentle way mm. which doesn't traumatize them no matter what they've come for that they want to heal from you're not re-traumatizing them so it's it's different to other forms of counseling that some people yeah. prefer this way yeah, I was just going to say, it feels like in the mainstream kind of counselling, as someone that has, you know, that I have had counselling and being through that kind of mainstream process, it is massively process driven and you are constantly having to unveil yourself over and over again. And not just, I guess it's in lots of different spheres like work, if you're at university and you're having to disclose all of this stuff um, to different people all of the time every single time you do it you are re-traumatizing yourself and in the process when you said about um I really agree with you when you're saying about this without judgment it's it's such a gift because at every single stage even though these systems may say that they don't judge or like there's you know there's no harm in kind of coming forward or you, you're courageous in sharing your words or whatever there's still an element that isn't that isn't true and you do feel that if you do share certain things that you will feel the repercussions of that um yeah i mean it it's for in any mental health thing that there, there shouldn't be a stigma but people still feel a stigma mm. if you go to your hr department because you've got problems you know you don't really feel like you can open up a lot of the time because you think it's gonna bite you on the bum when you go for another job Mm -hmm. even if it's not officially allowed to be reported somehow they find out in yeah. some cases you know I, I don't know every situation obviously but yeah so it, it can be very different I mean it's like one one lady I saw I don't know whether you know what the bleak test is the bleak test is something that like the prison officers have to do and she was a prison officer in a in a prison and the police do it and it's a fitness training yeah I've had so to do that to before yeah and it's quite work. tough you have to do things in certain times between the sounds of the bleeps like running backwards and forwards and you're not allowed to go faster you're not allowed to go too yeah. slow and it changes and it can be really tough and she had she was allowed I think a third attempt because of she'd gone through like her mum had died or different things so she was being allowed this third attempt but basically if she didn't pass this she was going to be out of the job that she loved doing and when she did it the first time which and the only time she'd done this before when she got the job initially I think it was three or four years before mm. the guy that had tested her had in her words had been quite sexist and didn't really feel women should be in a man's prison working and he's going oh you only just passed that by the skin here. he said all these horrible things to her and of course now this test is coming up again plus she'd been through the trauma of losing mm. her mum she was just in a mess she just she knew physically she was capable Mm -hmm. but mentally she was screwed because she had the same guy testing her as well and so all the negative feelings and the comments that she'd heard and she thought she'd put aside had all come back mm. so she just needed that confidence and that was a case of um healing how she had felt about the last test and then actually getting her to work through in her mind with her imagination the test again so you kind of yeah. you run you run the test backwards. So I, I take her through it backwards as if um, listing different elements of it in the order backwards. In 
a disassociated way mm. the sort of third third person now see yourself blah 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 like that see yourself doing this see yourself doing that and then you pick on the same points going in the other direction but in an associated way you are now and of course then at the end oh you're now phoning up your husband to tell him you've part you know that kind of thing yeah and yeah I got a lovely lovely review from her telling me how it was it just happened and she passed and it felt totally happy about it and it was exactly as she had imagined it in that session and it's almost like the mind has practiced what it needs to do kind of it is like it's done its own revision so it's practiced what it needs to do mm. and then it's just carry it out on that on the actual moment when the test was there so that was that was really nice for her I, just, I did have to research what a bleep test was though before <laughs> <laughs> but hey you know every day's a school day as they say <laughs> yeah so, I mean I don't mind telling people if I don't know what something is I will be honest and say look I don't know but I will find out before yeah. you come about it you know you can't know everything <laughs> it's yeah I want to dig in a little bit to what you were saying sorry about um the relationship between um you know if, if, especially in that case with um the woman that you saw before this the relationship between like healing and and that retraining of your brain and that process you know this pit like and um, the disassociation and the association yeah how you see the relationship between do you see them as being interconnected or isolated can you have healing without yeah it all depends on what they come from i mean i could have two people come for the bleak test a similar problem but i might treat them in a completely different way so it just depends on the person and what feels right I, i've not got any i never ever go into a session with a plan mm. or an idea i don't always even know what they're coming to me for when they turn up mm. you know it's been so sort of loose or they just can't get the words out or they say oh, you know, i'd rather talk to you when i'm there and in person you know, and see you and so yeah you don't go in in with a plan at all and it's just a kind of a gut feeling i suppose i've got all these techniques some of which i may have completely forgotten that I know but then when you need them yeah. they instinctively just jump out and you like, where did those words come from mm. but mm. yeah just so it seems to it seems to work that way just sort of running on instinct unfortunately because we're not governed by any body that we have to be governed by mm. you haven't got any boxes to tick and you haven't got a prove to somebody else oh yeah I've done that bit I've done A I've done B I've done C and so you are allowed to work with your instincts on what feels right and I always sort of say to the clients as well you know if, if you don't have to take any suggestions that I give you or you might want to adapt the suggestions the subconscious theory is that the subconscious mind won't take something unless it's good for them okay although this idea of the conscious mind and the subconscious mind is is just like a model mm. you know it's not who knows whether it's real or not you know nobody can everybody talks about their mind you know what's on their mind but if you ask somebody well, where is your mind yeah it's like an ab abstract thing yeah. isn't it so but it helps us kind of to categorize and understand so you said about peeling the layers of the onion mm -hmm. um last time when we spoke you explained a little bit more about that could you tell us how you do that about connecting with the different ego uh, well when we were talking about the parts therapy do you mean before yeah um so there's ego state therapy or parts therapy which is pretty much the same thing and again it's just somebody's model of the world mm. so for instance or people talk about wearing different hats you know i'm a grandmother i'm a mother i'm a wife i'm a therapist i'm a friend i'm a pet owner you know i'm all these different roles and in each role, I'll be a different person. Mm. You know, if I'm with a romantic night out with my husband, one day, again, hopefully, <laughs> COVID <laughs> over, COVID <laughs> last, you know, I will be like a different character to if I was out with the girls having a laugh one night or mm. out just looking after playing with my one of my grandchildren. I'd be a different person. So we've all got these different characters within us. And it's, for instance, when you're lecturing, you'd have your lecturing hat on. Mm, yeah. now if you brought to that lecture a mother's hat then you wouldn't be doing your best for your students that day 
the same as if you came home with your lecturer's hat on and you started speaking to your child, your child would think, you know, who is this? Who, who is this woman? You know, he wouldn't <laughs> recognise you perhaps. Mm-hmm. And the, the rapport between you wouldn't be what it normally is. So I have to draw out that particular person, that particular part of that person that's got the problem and work mm-hmm. with that part of them, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's like we were saying, I think, in a previous conversation as well, you know, quite often the problem is something that started or behaviour that was learned because of something that happened when they were a child. Mm-hmm. Something they would never think consciously is related. But once they're under and you regress them back, something completely different can come out and so that would be you've, you've gone back layers to this childhood and you have to heal that child in that mode and when you're talking to somebody and they've been regressed not always but sometimes their voice will go back to being a child and the way they're speaking is like a six-year-old they, they have become that six-year-old effectively mm-hmm. and so you can heal that child and explain to them you know things weren't their fault etc and also it's called inner child work and so you, you do the healing for that child and you would bring in the adult self to speak to that child and to tell that child how happy you are that they were born and that you'll always love them and you'll always protect them and you're sorry they had to go that through that whatever it was but you're grateful that they went through that for them to make them the person they are today mm-hmm. and then you kind of lead them on a path together where they you integrate them so it's, it's kind of like um, you, you get them to imagine that child shrinking in size and getting smaller and smaller and smaller so they can pick them up and put them in their heart where they're going to be safe forever. And that's normally when you get the tears. Mm. Just not falling, but you see tears just trickling down. Mm. That's when the healing's taken place. Mm. And then sometimes I'll bring in, um, for instance, I had somebody the other day for confidence with females very right. shy man in his 50s and I brought in his future self we, we healed back from what had happened it was an illness he he had a diagnosis of an illness when he was young and it was kind of from that and he'd missed a lot of schooling over the years as well mm-hmm. and so we did the healing the inner child and a couple other bits and pieces but then I also brought in his future self from in five years time and I did I don't know if you've heard of chair work where he imagined his future self sat on a chair next to him right. and he had to listen very carefully and his future self told him how he'd become this confident person and got him to express exactly how he'd done it in detail and also then told him exactly how good it felt and then the two chairs he imagined the two chairs morphing in together and becoming one so they were integrated so he had inside him that child that had been hurt that was now healed, plus this future person who was being how he wanted to be, and plus himself. And that's a, in that that's kind of like the bulk of that work. Obviously, it's, it's a lot takes longer than just a few minutes, but essentially that was two sessions, and the first session was primarily just finding out exactly what he wants, how he wants to be, how that's going to make a difference to his life how he'll recognize when he's there so people people know what they want and they know how to get there usually Mm. but they haven't had the headspace and the belief in themselves to realize they can get there it's fascinating how healing that inner child can have such an impact definitely definitely and it's fascinating as well how how it's not always something you would relate relate to I mean another you can kind of see how it makes sense afterwards I mean somebody who came for a real fear of dogs she would get off the bus the 21 year she would get off the bus at different bus stops she would cross roads she hadn't been to a lot of friends houses they had to she wouldn't go to the beach she wouldn't go to the park and it really was affecting her life mm. none of her family that she knew had any problem with dogs they'd never got a dog because she had this fear even though the family had wanted one and they, you know she'd have various outer you know, aunts and things with um, dogs but she wouldn't go to their houses which affected all of the whole family growing up because they couldn't go 
And that went back to when she was three or four years old. She saw herself in the local park to where she lived, where we both live. It's back waving. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, yeah, she was there and her cousins who don't live locally were there. And consciously, she couldn't remember this at all. But un under hypnosis, she, she was recalling this. And they were playing and her mum was there and her cousin's mother was there and her mum kept shouting out be careful be careful thinking you know you don't want you to fall over because you're playing on these things in the park play park and that. but she said oh mum's saying be careful oh i can hear dogs barking and it was just coinciding that every time her mum was saying be careful mm -hmm. she could hear dogs barking even though she was in the off you know secluded off play area it had nothing yeah. to do with those dogs but that is how her mind had thought oh dogs barking danger yeah, and so so that's you know, the, and the realization is is usually enough when it's something sort of simple, kind of fairly simple like that. And so she still then had to kind of learn about the behavior of dogs because she hadn't known how to watch the body language of dogs. Fortunately, because I've got three dogs, I was able to bring the dogs in one at a time. And she actually took all three of my dogs for a walk, so we know she was cured. And she wants to have a dog when she's got her own home as well. But yeah, she not got a problem she can go wherever she wants now and it's not an issue at all and she does stay in touch she's actually got a few other people over to me as well which she's recommended so, so that's nice i'm really pleased because i love dogs <laughs> yeah. so, so it really varies yeah. who you get in you get quite i get quite a lot of people i've trained in a lot of sexual dysfunction work with i must give a mention kaz riley sexual freedom hypnosis because she's quite unique in her trainings and her modern ways of doing things because it's, it's an area that a lot of people were scared to touch on it's like sex oh no they can't talk about that you know must do that and also because they're frightened sometimes of uh being on a one-to-one -one with somebody from a safety aspect and getting accused of things so mm. they steer away from it, a lot of people which makes me want to do it more <laughs> yeah so i get a lot of um people like with the endometriosis yeah uh, so then they've got this fear of sex because it's painful. Mm. It's often painful for them. And then because you think it's going to be painful, you clench up. Mm. And then it's even more painful. Mm. Same as imagine this. But, you know, this. So again, it's, it's those self-limiting beliefs that you need to get rid of. And, and teaching the women with endometriosis, a lot of it is teaching them to relax the body. Because they quite often they haven't relaxed. Because yeah. It's always on their mind. With a lot of illnesses as well and once they realize that they can relax themselves and you teach them how easy it is to relax a part of their body and then you just say well you can actually relax your vagina just as easily mm. and they realize it is actually you know you, you can do it it's just that self-belief and not expecting the worst all the time mm. But also, I mean, there's also things like the control room you can use for lots and lots of things. And that's that's where you, again, somebody's under hypnosis and you take them into their own mind and ask them to look for the control room. You get them to confirm they found it. And, you know, I don't know how your, your two, I don't know how your control rooms would look to you if you looked in your mind. But everybody gets Very an image. Good. <laughs> Full of stuff. <laughs> So, so what's the control room? Well, the control room is all full of levers, dials, or buttons. Ah, so it might be a decorated room. It, you know, it, it could be a cave. It could be anything. And then whatever you need to adjust in your life, you can find the control for it. So you can up your confidence one. Right. If you talk over people, you can find the button that adjusts that. Or you might just feel you want to just press the reset on every single thing as to how it was in the beginning if things have got out of hand and mm -hmm. you know and you talk them through how they can then take themselves at their when they're on their own they can take themselves back into the control they can adjust things if they need to readjust them at any time and they can then lock the door and only they've got the key you know so so nobody else has got the power to kind of adjust adjust those uh, settings it's down to them and it gives them control back effectively you know there's another thing as well with boundaries as well 
is that people find it hard to set their own boundaries mm. whether it's you know saying no to people which yeah. is okay to do you know we're, we're entitled to say no if we don't want to do something that's going to stress us out so there's a way of um it's very kind of I don't tell them what they're what it looks like for them I let them find it for themselves so whenever I do a boundary thing on myself I always kind of like see a moat this moat around me and the drawbridge is only going to go down to let in what I want what I want mm -hmm. and then the drawbridge comes up or if I want to put if I don't want something anymore I can put that drawbridge down in my mind and just see it leaving and so people can use that and quite often I kind of like introduce them to it under hypnosis and I just sit there and it could be a minute or sometimes it could be 20 minutes while they let things in, let things out. And then they just have a wander around and see if that feels okay for them. Mm. And, when, and the ones that take longer, they're the hardest only because I'm sitting there and I'm shutting up. <laughs> I find it hard to shut up sometimes. <laughs> but you can tell by the signs. I mean, you, you ask them to sort of say, let me know when you're done with a nod of the head or say I'm done sometimes you can just tell by the face changes the cut even the coloring in the face can change or all of a sudden you know they just they'll just give a sigh and it's like then you know that they're they're okay there's a lots of lots of body language that you're reading from people and facial expressions as well as what they're telling you you know it might be there's physical techniques as well that you can use you know you might have somebody with their arm and catalepsy up here and then it's just kind of like when you know that everything that needs to be resolved and it's changed in your mind to where it needs to be, then your hand will start to lower down. And you can tell if, they, if it's going like that, you know, then you know they're doing that consciously. But if it's unconscious, it's kind of like it's mm. sort of jerky. And so you know that when the hand's down on the lap again, that you know that they, they've kind of done the work internally. Mm. So there's lo loads of different methods you can use. And it's just how, a case of um, yeah I was when you were saying about body language being so central and kind of seeing how people are reacting not just by talking to you but seeing how they are visually in their faces obviously zoom teams all of these different um technologies we can't you know I can't we can't see as kind of detailed like uh features on our face of our faces and on and we can't really see all the time unless you are actively um showing your body language what that's like so i wanted to see how the pandemic's affected your healing practices and i i find i don't need to put a glass on. i can see a bigger image of the face <laughs> it's actually easier for me. <laughs> i can see all the subtleties really without having to get really up close to someone but mm -hmm. um but on a sort of general scale, I always did online work as well as in person. I used to have an office, which I gave up because it wasn't worth me keeping, obviously, it, for the last year. And so it's opened it up a lot more for me. A lot of, I probably see, I guess, about 30% of my clients are in England and the rest are abroad now. Right. But it's kind of helped the online thing because people are used to Zoom now. Whereas they might have been a bit kind of, oh, I don't know, I don't feel like that, and a bit unsure. But now a lot of, you know, most people I think have used some kind of technology like Zoom or Teams, whether it's just, you know, speaking to family. And, you know, a couple of people, they're sort of like a little bit, oh, I'm not sure. And I just would say, well, have you spoken to any relatives on Zoom, on camera? And, oh, yeah, yeah. How does that feel? Oh, that's good. It's nice to you. So, well, do you kind of almost forget that you're not in the same room sometimes? Oh, yeah. And I said, well, that's exactly what it's like in therapy. You'll, you'll, you'll forget. And also, you know, they've got their eyes closed for a lot of it. Yeah, true. So, and I think sometimes as well, they quite like not having to make the effort of going out. If they're busy and people have, people do find it hard to make time for themselves. They put everybody else first. With this, this is saving them quite a bit of time. They literally just got to go to where wherever their computer is or their mobile phone now and it just saves it cuts down the time and they've got the comfort of being in their own home if they're starting off feeling anxious mm. so they, the anxiety doesn't normally last for long and it's normally, normally quite good fun you normally can have a giggle at some stage with some of the things i do <laughs> can't be happier <laughs> yeah. 
so we're, we're laughing there's a thing we do it's bob burns in up in montrose did this thing called the swan and it's basically those parts i'm referring to you can get a part or the unconscious to take control of the hand and it moves and does things and it gives yes or no's depending on how it wants to move but i think you gave quite a big yes we just did a fun thing wasn't therapy and a quite a big no and it can turn around and wave to people and that's a great way of with the right questions you get a lot done just with yes no's and i don't know's and the answers and it's very rare that you don't get that response from people mm. sometimes people will fight it and resist but generally they just it just happens almost as if it's just moving by itself and it's it's the truer answer often than what somebody would speak if we're just having an ordinary ordinary conversation because they're not kind of it's almost like they really aren't in control of this hand movement mm. so you get the, like the first honest answer but it's good fun because everybody's going like that's so weird because <laughs> <laughs> like, it really feels like hands is just moving by itself which mm -hmm. <laughs> there he is again <laughs> have you been doing some more drawing he's building a railway um, ah. But I, I wanted to say about the swan because you said um, the hand became my creative self. Yeah. Well, it was, no, curious, curious, I think curious, 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 self. curious. And it was really. Monkey. Yeah, the monkey. Hello, um, monkey. <laughs> the, so it became the curious self. And it was nice because um, you could tap into that in the following days when you felt like maybe you were slightly off or something and you could you could tap back into that feeling of that self it was really quite powerful it was nice actually it was a nice thing to tap into and to kind of to to draw on again as a as yeah a, if, um, that's it because you could almost use it as a self hypnosis technique i mean i've i've used it to get rid of headaches before i've asked for the part that's able to the part that's able and willing get rid of the headache can you come forward and take control of the hand and get a yes and a no and i thank you for coming forward etc i say can you do whatever you can to turn down that headache for me because i don't like it and i'll be able to get on with what i need to do or whatever and it tends to work really well and even the control room can work for headaches as well you can turn down turn down that sort of feeling of that message of pain so it's um it's very very useful and kids love it as well it's a great way of getting kids to communicate mm. you know if if a kid's not going to sleep you can bring out their one that wants to stay awake and find out why it's staying awake and say but you know and you can kind of reason with it and just say so well, look i tell you what if you if you let sarah go to sleep now then tomorrow you do know that sarah's gonna have loads and loads of energy don't you and you get this yes and, and isn't she gonna love having that energy so she can actually have more fun and play with her friends or get this done or get that done Yes. Do you think it's a good idea if she goes to sleep? Yes. Can you do that for her now? Yes. And it does work. It really works. And kids mm -hmm. just don't put up any resistance. And they talk themselves into whatever it is. But you can also do it then if if they don't want to tell you what's wrong. Well, let, let, let the part that's not feeling great come out. And if that part knows what's upsetting Sarah, but doesn't feel like it's feeling quite brave enough. Let it go and tell another part who is brave. And then that part can come and take control. And that part can tell us what's wrong. Mm. And that can, and that's a simple thing that parents can do. You know, parents can do that. You know, it's almost like they should be taught these simple techniques because they are so easy. And a child just accepts it. Yeah, I think. Because, sorry to interrupt but when you're tired and everyone is stressed or it's been a busy day you forget these things and it's about if you have these techniques that you can draw on that will pop in you know and that will make that makes a huge difference i'm going to try that yeah definitely yes yeah, it's, it's always thank each part it's important to thank that part for coming forward mm -hmm. and and just sort of sometimes if it's, if it's a bit of a shy part as well you can just sort of say well, I know you're probably a little bit shy because you've never, you, maybe you've never had a chance to talk to anybody. Maybe you feel like you've never ever been heard before. Mm. But now I'm really listening. You know, it's just, it's just, yeah, I just think, you know, 
parents should know how to do these things with their kids. Because I found as well, um, when I've done like just relaxation sessions for groups, they've all been kind of, oh, that was so nice and so chilled out. And and if, if I know they've got kids, I'll just say, oh, do you read stories, bedtime stories still? And usually, usually most parents do, I think, nowadays, you know, still read stories. But sometimes if it's like their third or fourth child, oh, well, not always. <laughs> They're getting a bit boring, the same story, you know, that kind of thing. I say, well, how you feel now is how your child feels at bedtime when you read them that story. They've calmed down the way you're feeling calm, their bodies muscles are relaxed their mind's been able to switch off from all the things of the day and you've just left them with that lovely pictures for their mind of the story mm. and kind of that's how important it is to read to the children still mm-hmm. and it's quite often they haven't thought of it in that way because mm-hmm. they've not had that since they were a child so they've kind of forgotten that lovely feeling that lovely end of day feeling but um, but they've you know they've managed to enjoy it and experience it, and I think that relaxation when you take people on a kind of a mindfulness journey, whether it is a traditional beach or whatever it is, or a garden that they're wandering through in their mind, I think that brings back that feeling they had as a child for them. Mm, yeah. No, I. Very cool. Um, <laughs> I was thinking as well about this link, and um, for me, what you're saying is like it's it's as you say it's so simple but we are taught to really forget imagination as soon as you hit kind of adulthood Mm -hmm. this kind of the ability to imagine and how critical it is in being able to heal but being able to relax all of these things um yeah I think it's busy with the world don't you Mm. you get too busy with life Mm. it is lovely i use tools as well i use toys i use toys in my sessions as well mm. so i've got this one. <laughs> oh, before that i was just thinking about the swamping so i had one lovely lad of 14 and i was teaching him how to put himself into hypnosis to relax before his surgery and one of the things i said, said to him when you've got your swan there i said um i said that part that loves hypnosis i have there and i said can you can you put him into hypnosis for me and he just started doing this and the boy went he was gone <laughs> <laughs> so that was great yeah this is one of my toys and this I can use to put people under as well just by getting them to focus on the bubbles on the ends and the shapes and that kind of thing I don't want to put you under now <laughs> you're getting glazed over there flick <laughs> sorry I was just looking at it I was like oh there is something <laughs> it's no, and, but then also you can get them when they're under you can get them to open their eyes as though awake but still in trance and you know that wonderful feeling you're feeling. Let it expand, 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 expand. And you can do like things like that. Or that feeling that you don't want it anymore. One, two, three, it's gone. You know, you can do things like that with toys. Mm. Or this is another one I use sometimes. But my letter X. I'll just get people to just, in their mind, trace it around with, with their eyes. And they do it a couple of times. Then with their eyes closed, they can still trace it around in their mind. And that starts activating their imagination, but also relaxes them because they're concentrating on that mm. and they're forgetting about everything else. Mm. And that can just be, yeah, especially if somebody's um, been hypnotized before, we can do all these things. Or, you know, I've got, I've got my bell as well, and you just sort of tap on the bell. We're going to go deep, deeper, deeper, you know, things like that. So, and then there's, there's my light. As well as that one, which changes, you might not be able to see it very well. I'm not used actually online, but it changes colors. Yeah, you can't really see it online. And so, again, with that, watch it change in color. Start to guess when you think it's going to change color. Mm. Close your eyes and see those color changes happening. And it just takes people under us, just different ways for different people. It's not always, it doesn't have to be a long, it's not always about relaxing the body bit by bit. Sometimes it just just be very quick. Or well, there's, if people are very analytical, for instance, mm. you just almost bombard, bombard their mind with lots of things to think about. Mm. And then when you get them confused, just at the moment, if you think they're, you know, they're like, what's going on? Sleep. And because they're so relieved to be in, have a clear instruction all of a sudden, they just go. Yeah. That can be, um, that's, that, that works really well on the people that think 
oh no no my mind's too busy I can't be hypnotized and funnily enough the ones that think they're never going to be hypnotized are usually the ones that tend to go deeper because they need that relaxation they need that that letting go and it's such a relief to them mm. yeah. yeah so it's quite sort of fun with those how much does play come into that then because you've got all these different tools that you're that are quite different um but mm. very, do, do you like play around but with them before you use that how do you know that they're going to kind of well work? i might use them um just as the induction the induction is a bit where you're putting somebody into it no so i might use them for that or i might mm. use it like i say with this one again to open eyes just enhance that feeling and it just mm. kind of accentuates it it kind of if somebody's quite visual they they quite they it kind of makes sense to them to see something getting bigger and getting smaller mm-hmm. and it, you know it might be sometimes you know if you've got again obviously not so much on zoom you can't do it, but if you've got a child in the room with you just let them play with them sit on the floor playing with them and they go into almost like a trance playing and just watching it going in and out and then you can ask them things and they'll answer because they don't feel inhibited in the same way they're they're kind of switched off almost and it's easier for them to talk so you can use them, you can use them in sort of several several ways and also it, it just makes it a bit more interesting sometimes i think it takes it away from being a typical therapy session you know it stops it being clinical which mm-hmm. isn't what people that people don't come to hypnotherapy i, I feel they don't come to hypnotherapy except for a clinical appointment they want it to be a little bit different. And I think when things, if you can make something a bit fun, it kind of, I don't know, I just feel it just sort of works better. People will look forward to coming again. It takes any fear away. And I, I like fun things. <laughs> it's good to have fun. It's always good to have a bit of fun. Even if something's really serious, you know, you can still have some fun within the session make them smile make them i'll never let anybody leave without feeling better without smiling and that's where i'm not knocking counseling it works for a lot of people Mm. but i'm a last resort people have normally either don't want to go there or they've been there and it hasn't worked for them so Mm. i'm kind of like the last resort that people don't necessarily think of initially it's not the first port of call if there's a problem and so i'm not although i'll say it's around an hour session we're in the middle of something i'll i'll go on you know sometimes it's gone on for two hours you know i won't as long as they're okay to stay longer if necessary so you haven't got that cut off okay your hours up now you've got to go and they're like i was right in the middle of and they're in a real mess but they've got to wait a week which can happen mm. unfortunately due to sort of nhs restrictions i think that's that's where it does vary and i think you know sometimes people have had had a problem for 20 years whatever it might be and they want to change they don't want that behavior in their life anymore they want to get over it and just live a happier life without that burden of whatever the problem was Mm. and just give them that headspace or quiet time just quieten their mind down enough that they can think clearly Mm. because you're busy 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 you you can't think clearly sometimes it's just overload Mm. you just need to just have an hour to just completely switch off and then all of a sudden everything it's like after a good night's sleep people say if you have a good night's sleep things are clearer in the morning and it's the same kind of principle I guess just have some peace real real peace in your mind and then you can just see things more clearly and the route to getting where you want to get to in life It's like we said about the imagination earlier as well, how that works. It's, it's like my belief is that if you imagine things how you want them to be, then the relevant parts of your brain are going to start working towards that goal. Yeah. But if you, if you can't see how it's going to be, how, how is your brain supposed to work out how to get there if it doesn't know where you want to get to? So practicing things in your mind of how you want them to be and imagining them as best you can and if you you know if you're imagining something it doesn't have to be that you're getting a real clear visual 3d picture mm. it could just be a sense of something mm. Mm. and that leads me on to it. a lot of people think you know i'm not very visual and you kind of say okay so if you had a lemon and an orange which, which color you know which one's yellow and they'll say oh the lemon 
well, how do you know that? Well, I just know it. But how do you know it? And that's the same kind of thing. It's just some things you just know. You don't have to physically see them. So you can kind of use your imagination in that way. That works really well for people. But again, you know, some people are more visual, some people are more auditory, some people are more kinesthetic. And you work with what the person is. You, you can quite quickly find out how the person is. And you just ask them to describe a beach. And it might be, oh, well, I can hear the waves. I can hear the children playing. Or it might be, oh, I can see the blue and green of the sea. I can see the yellow sand. Somebody else might be, oh, well, I'm walking on the sand and it feels really soft on my feet. I can feel a little breeze coming in off of the water. So you can very quickly and easily tell what they favour. And that's what you'll favour with when you're creating stuff for them in their mind, because it's what they resonate with. So that's all through like questioning it kind of at the beginning of the intake that you do you find those things out I and mean, they might think it's quite sort of random so it's saying describe a beach for me <laughs> but i also say to people I'll, I'll say things and i'll ask things but there, there'll be a reason for it so just just kind of keep an open mind and go with it yeah. mm. and there's other things that it's kind of like um i forget what they're called now pattern interrupts I don't know if you've come across pattern interrupts. Mm. Again, I'm, I'm not picking on you, Fabio, but I know you've got a son. So if your son was, I don't know whether he has tantrums or whether he had tantrums when he was little or, you know, <laughs> getting fed up, you know, and you can't get through, and they're not really hearing anything you say. If you turn around suddenly and said, oh, can you see that fire outside? It totally changes their train of thought. Mm and it's a pattern interrupt my mother does that perfects that yeah and that, that can either work really well just it throws you but it changes your mood then uh. and we we can use that when somebody's um kind of going over the same thing again in their mind they can't get beyond that bad thought or whatever it is you just throw yeah you just kind of throw them a curveball and then instantly go into something else and they just go with you because you've kind of almost thrown them and they think, oh, I don't know. And then they'll just go with what you're saying next. And you can change them into the positive way of thinking. I mean, some people it checks, say it changes the neuro pathways. I don't know whether it does or not. I couldn't honestly say, but I just know I kind of people some people want to have um, the science behind what happens in hypnosis and they want the proof. I'm not really that bothered with how it works, so long as it works, whether it's placebo whatever, as long as somebody's getting what they want at the end, that's, that's kind of all that matters for me. But, but we are beings that construct our realities and reconstruct our identities through our experiences. And, um, and, you know, I think in that sense, if we can reconstruct, like with the inner child, if we can say, I'm sorry that you experienced this and we love you and and, and somehow have that healing, then it doesn't really matter if there's a scientific basis for that. If that part of your identity, your part of yourself, then feels that it no longer hurt. Yeah, and, 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 and there that, is that child was listened to, even if it's 30 years later, who hadn't been listened to at the time, who didn't know how to say how they were feeling at the time. And quite often because they didn't understand what was going on, but now they, you know, going back and seeing it as an adult. With everything they know now as an adult it's gives them a totally different um sort of view of what happened okay. but just telling yourself you love yourself is very healing it sounds a bit kind of like tree huggery i suppose but it is quite healing and nice to be told that and nice to just have somebody say when you're a very suggestible state of hypnosis it's very nice to have somebody telling you good things about yourself and that it does actually sink in then when you're in that state you you do accept the suggestions a lot more as so long as they're good for you mm. and sometimes people just haven't had praise or they've not been able to accept praise and believe it but in that state they do believe it that doesn't mean i you know i'm not going to lie to somebody but you know yeah, but they um, 
Yeah, people just want to be heard, I suppose, and have their opinion validated. I mean, that's what it is, have to, have to just have, feel they're worthwhile. And what they've got to say means something to someone. Mm. And I think that's why a lot of people are struggling in COVID, because they're not getting to speak to anybody. Mm. They're not getting to share their thoughts and their ideas. Although it's for some people with anxiety I've spoken to, they've found it's actually helped because in a weird way, because they've now got a justifiable reason for feeling anxious for the first time. And they then realise they didn't really have a reason for feeling anxious before. It was just they were allowing the thoughts to go through their mind, thoughts that you, you can say, I don't want that thought. You know, we reject thousands of thoughts all the time. So now it's like, well, actually, yeah, there is something. So there is a reason for it. So there wasn't before. So I'm going to be OK once this COVID's over, I realise. And I've already learned a load of coping skills for when I had anxiety before. So actually, this is this is OK. So, so it's actually been helpful for some people, I think. Obviously not for some others. <laughs> but I've not had anybody come to me because of COVID. Mm. not well indirectly they've come to me because they've now had the time to address their problems but not because covid's caused them problems i haven't heard, you know maybe they've gone somewhere else i don't know but they've, you know they've not come to me which is, which is quite interesting i think maybe people as well are, i don't know if this is the reason but i do see a lot you know you look on twitter and social media i think mm -hmm. There's, people are finding solace in the collective kind of struggle of COVID. So maybe that is why, in the sense that people, on their own. lots of people are struggling or are dealing with stuff in a different way. I think that gives them comfort in the sense that they don't, they obviously they don't feel on their own, but they then don't feel, they don't feel like it's a problem because it's the norm, if it makes yeah. sense. Um, so they're not kind of, you know if you have anxiety or depression or any kind of um mental health illness that makes you the outlier or the or the other yeah, it's exclusively just them that's the yeah that nobody else could possibly understand mm. whereas i think this kind of yeah it, it gives people the opportunity to kind of to sort of hide a little bit um and not to be as kind of no i know what yeah. you're saying there Mm. I think you're right, absolutely. Yeah, and people need to feel part of a gang. Mm. They feel part of something and included, and that's kind of what it does. It might be the first time they're suddenly, yeah, like you say, we're, we're all in the same boat. Mm. Obviously, it's worse for others. Which is, uh, but, uh, but you know, I've, I feel like I need a nap now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so calm. And I know Flick is just, I can just see her eyelids kind of, she's like, I think we're both sort of I just, just gone into my Zen voice. I know, hearing you talk about all the different techniques, I just felt like I was just listening properly for it. We were talking, we had a session yesterday about like music and law and improvisation and play. And essentially we're just talking about listening, but like not listening on this way that we all listen kind of in whatever else, the non-work stuff. And we're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've already anticipating the response. So we don't really listen. And we think our thing that we're going to say is much better yeah. anyway. Um, but yeah, I feel like today <laughs> I've like properly listened. <laughs> I've, I've given it when some people kind of, you know, when you have a chat with somebody going from what you were just saying, Flick, that something, you know, they're jumping at the bit just to say their bit yeah. so they're not hearing what you're going to say and I've had people come to me with that that they want to stop I, mm -hmm. I I used to talk over people and it's awful and um I sort of say to people you take 10 seconds before you say open your mouth and speak after somebody finishes speaking mm -hmm. just give it 10 seconds <laughs> and it shows that you're actually listening because in that 10 seconds you can you know mm -hmm. jump in the gun you kind of, and it, they'll listen to you more as well then. Mm. Because they feel you've listened to them. It's kind of like that 10 second rule. Just, so it's like you're kind of just taking on board what they've just said, giving yourself that chance to think about what they've said 
before and it can change what you were going to say as well sometimes yeah. in a good way <laughs> people often think they know what when a problem started but it, it's it's often earlier that's kind of like the final straw normally you know they, they've reacted to something as it usually is something before they're seven they've reacted to something in a certain way and it's worked for them and then something similar happens and it's almost like their brain's going through a filing cabinet or when so, oh yeah that happened that's worked I'll do this again mm. then something similar happens it gives them a similar feeling shall we say rather than a, a similar event they get that similar feeling of fear or whatever it was okay that worked but as they get older that original when they were five years old what they did that worked it's not working but it's the default solution. So it's almost like unlearning mm -hmm. to get them over, over how they react to, say, a fear of spiders. You know, they don't need to react in the way they might have reacted as a child if somebody dangled one in their face or whatever. It, reality, you know, you know rationally that spider can't hurt you in this country and anyway. that spider can't hurt you, got, you, you know, you, you can walk past it, it can't do anything to you the most it's going to do is land on you and tickle you as it walks along or something but because you totally freaked out as a child you think that's what you've got to do each time mm. yeah. cool. this has been really really good um i like i think we're all so pacified now i don't know we don't know how to um find a good ending to this um because it just feels like we're so calm so is there anything at the end you would like to say to close it just, just thank you and if anybody is watching don't be scared to ask for help mm -hmm. there is nothing that is silly if it's upsetting your life or causing even a small problem for you just just reach out there's going to be a solution there mm. that's that's yeah. such a positive thing mm. thank you yeah and there's always something good around the corner for everyone always mm. yeah be happy oh Ruth thank you so much for joining us today we really appreciate it I feel <laughs> I don't know what it is and it's not to sound cliche you do have such a calming effect every time we you know we're talking about stuff just normal stuff um so I really appreciate I'm sure I'm not just boring you to sleep <laughs> no, 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 no I just feel uh, wake up <laughs> count you up and wake you up and energize <laughs> 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 what you don't know is you've actually been hypnotized the whole time we've already done this talk <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>